This is where we left off yesterday, and we'll press on with these notes. I think that uh, completing the packet and the end of chapter problems will be much easier for you if we can get through these, the rest of them today. So, free trade. There's two ways to regulate trade. Regulate what comes in, regulate what goes out. So, inward-oriented policies um, are tariffs which limit what comes in and policies which limit investments from overseas. We don't need your stinking money kind of policies. Um, the goal is to try and raise living standards within the nation by the nation. So inward looking trade limitations are pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mentality. We don't need anybody else's help. We can do this. Come on, rah, rah, us. Then there's outward oriented policies which aim to create a true free trade environment. No restrictions on trade. Um, our existing NAFTA agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement, is an outward oriented policy. We had drastically cut down on trade limitations uh, between the United States, Canada, Mexico, and that's been in place since the Clinton administration. Um, Outward-oriented policies also openly seek and encourage and look for um, foreign investment in your nation. Outward-seeking doesn't mean that a nation doesn't think it can pull itself up by its bootstraps. It's just the nation's recognizing that it would be easier if it didn't have to do it all by itself. If the money is out there and the trade opportunities are out there, go seek them. Again, the outward seeking allows you to engage in specialization. The inward seeking prevents specialization and all of the efficiencies that come along with it. So our idea that trade can make everyone better off. So when we went through the scenarios and you guys decided, I think one of you said, well, trade makes everybody better off, so we should trade. Pretty much. Trade will do the same thing as discovering new technology or learning how to use a resource that had been previously underutilized. It can dramatically improve productivity. And it can be a virtually overnight kind of thing. Countries that have inward-oriented policies have traditionally failed to grow very much, while countries with outward-looking policies have grown a great deal. And this applies historically as well as in the modern day. Think about uh, back to your World Civ class and China and Japan and how they closed off from the outside world and how behind they were when they rediscovered the outside world. One of the best examples is Russia. Think about how far behind Russia was. Peter the Great comes in, he tries to open up to the West, start trade, and then things kind of shut down again. And so when we get to the Russian Revolution, everything needs to be caught up again. And Russia still hasn't caught up because the Soviets were an inward-looking nation. Um, Argentina in the 20th century under Juan Perón um, has, was a very inward-looking nation. Um, kind of a Soviet satellite nation to some extent, um, had tremendous economic stagnation. It's why they're relatively uh, unstable today. Some of the outward-looking countries, um, South Korea, Singapore, one of the wealthiest per capita in the world, and Taiwan, after uh, they received recognition from most of the global community. Okay, research and development. 
What's the shorthand for research and development? R&D. Okay, technological process, or technological progress, is why standard of living goes up over time. We know that technology is constantly changing and ever advancing. We talked a couple of days ago, maybe on Monday, about how the rate of that progress has seemed to accelerate over time. And that's because technology builds on technology. And when you have very little technology, it's hard to advance much. But when you have a fair amount of technology, and you can begin to combine them, and when you dedicate resources to research and development, you can see rapid advances. Okay. Knowledge is a public good. And this is a little difficult here because public goods and private goods tend to be a micro concept, and we left micro before we got to this. So a public good is this. It is a good where one person using it does not infringe upon the ability of another person to use it. Okay. Now there are some public goods where that can really be tested, like our roads. Public goods, roads are public goods. If Tony is on 84th Street driving to school, does that make it impossible for Warren to also be on 84th Street driving to school? Yes. Well, other than the fact that Tony is hazardous, but there's still plenty of room on the road for you to get your car on the road. Public good. Halleck Park. Can uh, Jackson be down there with his buddies playing Ultimate and uh, uh, Austin still go down and feed the duckies with his girlfriend? Oh. <laughs> what? I said what girlfriend? Well, he has an imaginary girlfriend. Absolutely, he can. Absolutely, they can both coexist in that way. Um, there are some public goods that we kind of wish weren't public goods. Have you ever been in a hotel and you put on your trunks and you go down to the pool and you slip into the hot tub and you're like, oh yeah, this is the best. And you're just chilling and relaxing. And then that 300 pound hairy gorilla with the speedo on comes over and gets in and you're like, oh, yeah, time to go back to the room. I think there's a movie on I wanted to catch, right? It's public good. You being in there doesn't prevent him from being in there. Maybe your personal desire to not share the hot tub with him, but it's public good. You're able to use it at the same time. Okay? So knowledge is a public good. If Isabella possesses the recipe to chocolate chip cookies, that's knowledge, right? It means nobody else in the universe can make chocolate chip cookies. No, it doesn't, because knowledge is a public good. You aren't the sole owner of that information. Now, do we have some laws that regulate access to some knowledge? Yeah. Like what? Like Patents and secret recipes, yes. And so that allows folks to make some money off of the investment in their research and development before their knowledge becomes a public good. New pharmaceuticals are patent protected for a certain amount of time before that recipe is turned over and before they come, become generic goods. Okay? So there are policies to promote that technological pat process. And the first one is, as Grant said, patents. It takes time and money to come up with new stuff, and so you need to be able to regain that time and money. Yes, sir? Have you ever watched Shark Tank? Occasionally. It's like a really good economic show. It is. It is. It's also marketing. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. Tax incentives or direct support. I've been fishing for grants a lot lately. And boy, when you go on to the government websites and you look at the grants that they're offering, here's a grant. This grant. There's a grant. There's a grant. Uh. Can this class offer this grant? Yeah. Um, a grant is just a government gift of money. Here, here's the money. Go do what we want you to do and then come back and tell us how it turned out. So there are government grants to study why the 
three-winged butterfly of southern uh, New Mexico is uh, dwindling in its population. Okay, that's, no, uh, there's no three-winged but I don't know. So that's a piece of direct support. Tax incentives um, could come in the form of um, tax breaks to corporations who show in their tax returns that they designated a certain percentage of their funds to research something that the government has said, we got to find a solution to this. And then the government and businesses will offer research grants to universities. Because a business is primarily in the business of making money. And if it's a publicly held business, they're responsible to their shareholders to improve that stock price so that the shareholder can profit. Universities are not for profit. They need money to pay their employees, but they get some of that through tuition and other through research grants. And through doing the research, the university professors acquire more knowledge, thus making everybody better off because the knowledge they get is a public good. Thank you. So, population growth. Is it good to have more people, or is it bad to have more people? We kind of debated this one a little bit. Didn't truly come to resolution, did we? Okay. Population growth can have three primary impacts on your standard of living and productivity. Too many people can stretch your natural resources. There's only so much fresh water. There's only so much food, there's only so much living space, on and on and on and on and on. There is a guy, an economist and sociologist, who 200 years ago said that uh, population growth was going to mess things up for us. His name was Thomas Malthus. He's the guy who said there will always be a permanent underclass in society because we will always have too many people to be accommodated with the resources that we have. Was Malthus right? Since he said that, our world population has increased sixfold. So. What's happening? Six times. Six times over. Sixfold? Uh -huh. Somebody says that I'm always confused. Is it six times exponentially or six times? It doubled, and then that doubled, and then that doubled. That's the fold. So I suppose that's factorially. Is that? I don't, I don't. Because. It's not just what the population was 200 years ago times six. Two to the six. It's that population doubled, and then it doubled. population times two to the six. Yeah, it yeah. doubled six times. Okay, thank you, math heads. That population times two to the sixth. Yeah. I was right. about to say, so just to the sixth would be a lot different. Times two to the sixth. That's right. Okay. Um, so, if Malthus had been right, we would be a lot worse off today than folks were 200 years ago. And I don't exactly think that that's the situation, right? I have central heating, central air, car to drive, plenty of food in my refrigerator. Right? Yeah, more than one set of clothes to wear. I get more than a pair of shoes a year. It's a pretty good life, right? So, how did Malthus so misjudge? What didn't he take into account? Increase in technology. Boom. Just about to come out of my mouth. Increase in technology. He did not think that we would get better at doing stuff that we do or get more efficient at doing it. He also thought that humankind was about as productive as it was ever going to get. So as we became more productive, we were more able to sustain that population growth.
No, his lifespan wasn't long enough for that. Now, just because Malthus was wrong, does that mean that population growth doesn't stretch our natural resources? Yep. No. It's still a factor. Definitely. Okay. Population growth dilutes the capital stock. Uh-oh. Economic use of common words. Wait a minute. What's capital stock? Uh, how much physical capital? Is. Physical capital, yeah. So if everybody on Earth had their own plow to plant their own crops and feed themselves, and we doubled the population, now everybody on Earth has to share that plow with another person. So the question is, does less physical capital per person impact our productivity? We know that it does. We've already seen the production function. So how do we deal with that? A bigger population is a bigger L, right? Which means that we're dividing K by a bigger number, which means our result is going to be a smaller number. Lower productivity, lower living standards. That's right, boys and girls, don't have babies. They'll end up poor. Except that hasn't been true in the United States. But do you know what they're saying? They're saying you guys are the first generation who may not end up better off than your parents. Nice face. Yeah, it's kind of a disappointment. I, I think that that depends by the individual. I'm certainly not better off than my parents were. Um, but this also depends on the nation you're in. All right? Are there Chinese babies who have been born over time who ended up better off than their parents? Yeah. Are there Chinese babies who didn't? Oh, yeah. Back in the 80s and 90s, there were lots and lots and lots of famines in Africa. Small Ethiopia had huge famines. Some of those babies didn't work out so well for them either. Okay. Um, the faster the population grows, the more children we have, and the more work our educational system has to do. And so the less efficient that educational system is, so the lower our H ends up being. We try to accommodate that and deal with it by passing laws like no child left behind. Every child can learn the exact same stuff exactly equally and be equally successful because we say they can. If you look around you walking down the halls there might be a, a nugget of reality that should be taken into account there. Now does that mean that every child can't learn? No. Every child can learn. But to what level? And do they want to? And do they want to? And that's one thing the education system has never been able to figure out. It's the old, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. If it's not thirsty, it's not drinking. I don't care. If you've ever, don't try to fight the horse about taking a drink. It's not going to happen. Same thing with a child. It used to be, though, who made the child want to learn. Yeah. Yeah get good grades or, right? And increasingly, the numbers of parents who just don't have time to engage with their kids or choose not to for whatever reason increases and there's the strain on the educational system. The other strain on the educational system is a societal change here. 100 years ago, who went to school? A 100 years ago, who went to school? Pretty much everybody, except for the extraordinarily poor. But even those parents saw the value and tried to get their kids. How long did kids go to school? Eighth grade was considered a full normal education. Um, farm kids, rural kids, went to school for a very abbreviated year. They needed to be out helping on the farm. That's what they were there for. Because they didn't have 
a John Deere tractor and a combine that dad could do it all by himself all day long, right? So the world has changed. Our expectations have changed. We have you in school longer each day, longer school year, more people go to school. Everybody is expected to go to school. So our H is much higher even though we continue to put a strain on it. Okay. Countries with very rapid population growth tend to have a much lower H. And that is simply because schools are capital structures. They are expensive to build. They take time to build. You don't just pop a school up overnight. Our new middle school that they're going to build out west, they bought the land last year. They had to have it designed, then they put it out for bids, they've got their contractor now, then they have to get the permits, and then there's the whole building process. When's that middle school set to open? For the fall of 16, I think. If you took Lincoln out past where it becomes a gravel road, it's going to be, it's north of the ballpark, and east of that dam site. Way out there. Oh, you guys know I serve on the Planning Commission. We've approved the addition of over, I want to say, over 750 additional rooftops out in that region north and south of 370 within the past eight months. So, yeah, it's... Uh-huh. There's a new elementary school that's going to be going up to. Where are those kids going to go to high school? Well, those lines haven't been drawn yet. They'll decide. They've got like eight or so years, though, so. Except they don't, because it opens in 2016, and the next year those eighth graders have to go somewhere. They don't just all start Yeah. <laughs> they won't let any... Yeah, they, each year they hire the next grade of teachers. Yeah, we only take kindergartners this first year. <laughs> That's a cool philosophy, though. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So, to deal with the dilution of the capital stock, a lot of nations use some policies to try and limit population growth. For instance, can you think of an easy one? China's one-child policy, yeah. You'd pay huge penalties if you had a second kid to be able to keep it. And in China, you want your child to be a boy. Because in the Chinese culture, sons take care of their parents. They live in multi-generational households there, and so the parents move in with the son. If you've got a daughter, she's going to move away and take care of her husband's parents, and you are left to rot. Which is why it's so much easier to adopt a Chinese baby girl. Because if you, you have that baby and you give birth and it's, uh-oh, it's a girl. They find their way to orphanages, churches, ditches all the time. Okay? Um, contraception education and the availability of contraception. So our scenario, I think, said giving condoms away. Okay, if it's there and it's free, and you've been told what the benefit to using it is, that certainly increases the likelihood of its use over, over um, you having to find out about it, having to go and purchase it, et cetera, et cetera. this point, Nick, Pope is outside the room talking to someone in the hall. Okay, I'll check. Let me know. Okay. Just let me know. Hey, Nick. Oh, is she yeah, hey, Nick. I Everybody her, say hi, Nick. I let her know you were talking to someone in the hallway. Oh, you said, hey, Nick. She's, okay, cool. Thank you. Then I don't have to go back and edit that out. Um, sometimes this doesn't work real well. Depends upon your population. In India, shortly after the pill became a thing in the 70s, India was having major population growth issues. And at that point in time, it was a tremendously still backwards nation. Um, not that there isn't still huge poverty in parts of India. Um, and so they decided, well, 
here we go. They would tried the condoms and the education, and men in India, culturally, it wasn't happening. Not going to happen. So they said, well, okay, let's put it in the women's hands, because the women understood what a huge strain another mouth to feed was on their family. They didn't have to understand the big picture about economic growth for the nation. They just understood another baby makes life really hard around here. So they said, well, we'll give women the pill. We'll provide it for free. They can all have it. Well, the thing about the pill is you take it for three weeks, and then you don't for a week. And you take it for three weeks, and you don't for a week. But the folks who were having issues with population control in India were the poor who lacked education. So they were illiterate. So we'll, we'll give them all a calendar. If they can't read the days on the pill packet, we'll give them all a calendar. That didn't work either. If you're illiterate, chances are numbers and calendars and which month it is aren't working out for you either. So what's the one thing that everybody can use to tell how time passes? Think of the other side of the day. The moon. The moon and its phases. And how long does a moon cycle last? About 28 days. Which is why sometimes you'll have two full moons in a month. So, okay, every woman can look out and see the moon, and, oh, when it's a full moon, I don't take the pill. Now the full moon's gone, okay, I start the pill again. Great! Except most of India did not have indoor plumbing, running water. So where did you go to bathe and to do your laundry? The river. Where'd you go to get your water for cooking? See the problem? Mm -hmm. Massive population of India's women all on the same menstrual cycle at the same time. Aside from the colossal PMS issues monthly, um, yeah, it was, it was a sanitation wow. issue in a big way, and they walked away from that real fast. Walked away from the river real fast. <laughs> 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 yes, they did. Ultimate uh, it was almost of biblical proportions, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. So, educate women to understand what the cost of having more babies is. Because women, even since the beginning of time, have understood that there are ways to decrease the likelihood of pregnancy and uh, can do things to inhibit that. Kind of makes me wonder if Nick will set this to play and then hold his phone and record the... <laughs> no, he, he just watches the lecture getting Dick's notes there. All right, so promoting technological pros progress. Population growth can promote technological growth. More people, just by percentages, more people equals more scientists, more inventors, more engineers, right? The more scientists, engineers, inventors you have, the more they're going to figure out. The more they figure out, the faster our technology improves, the more productivity we have, the more economic growth we have, the higher our standard of living becomes. Yay! So... According to this one, we want more people because they make us better off. But according to the last one, more people make us worse off. But so, what, how, what do we do? Do we make more people or do we not? I don't know. We make a certain amount of more people, but not too many. So you make more people, but within reason. So, as the world's population has increased, productivity has grown since the beginning of recorded history. 
and more populated regions have grown in population more rapidly than less populated regions. Why do you suppose that is? More people make more babies, absolutely. And less populated regions, why are they less populated? Because no they're hard to live in because there's a lack of resources. There's a reason Alaska is not our most populous state. There's a reason the population of the Saharan region in Africa the Sahel is not overflowing, right? It's just darn hard to live there. And what's the inevitable result if you try to make two babies, too many babies while you're living in that region? They die. Yeah, they're not going to be able to be sustained. They're going to die, and so the population growth is going to be naturally limited. Right? Yeah, you go to carry the groceries in from the car when you're living up on the Arctic Circle, and you set the baby down outside the door to unlock it and go to pick it up, and you've got baby popsicle. Yeah, it's kind of the natural order of things. It's, yeah. About the Alaska thing, I once had an argument with someone about um, Texas being bigger than Alaska. Alaska's bigger. Yeah. And this was in Texas. Well, okay, clearly he was taking into account the egos of the Texans as well. And then, yes, Texas dwarfs everything. In that case, Texas is bigger than Russia. Bigger and than that's competition. Texas is the United States. Are you kidding me? They're separate countries. Yeah, people, yeah. There's people know Texas, California, New York. Texans claim to be the only state that was ever a sovereign nation. They forget about California being the Bear Republic. Oh, and um, let's think. Um, oh, yeah, the hundreds of year long monarchy that ruled Hawaii. Mm, minor detail. Anyway. This is it for the lecture for this chapter. It just stopped. Well, yeah. So let's review. So list the determinants of productivity, right? So your determinants of productivity, you already had those because you've got the productivity function, right? This is all review. What can you do to boost productivity? Encourage saving and investing, encourage investment from abroad, provide public education. I'm kind of proud. I actually guessed right about the, the amount of time it would take on this chapter. I got the lesson plans right. Won't have to shift. Yay! Yeah, it's, it's even more straightforward than the unemployment chapter. So for tomorrow, you need to get those end of chapter problems done. I'll also entertain questions over the um, packet. If you've got the packet done and you want to just check your answers, you can do that too. I'll hand you the key. Hopefully you've been working on the packet a little bit along the way. I don't like packets. So what? No. Packets are so he convenient. Said, he said he doesn't like packets, and I'm like, it's really convenient. Okay. Additional policies to boost productivity are patent laws, control of population growth. It's the first country to have public education. Depends upon how you define public education. If you're talking about like the model we have where everybody has equal access. Yeah, like free. Um, No, if you consider um, minorities who were excluded historically. 
until well into the 19th or into well into the 20th century. Um, in that case, France beats our pants off under Napoleon. Um, Britain also has a good tradition of having allowed access to public education, and then the rich folks paid for a better private education, um, and they would probably beat us too. Um, they let women be educated a lot earlier as well. Um, that's that's a it's, it's a nuanced question. The answer to it is so that's actually fairly difficult to answer. Um, no, but boy, American exceptionalism tells us we'd like to think so. Okay, good now. That was a really good idea. Um, ben Franklin should get a lot of the credit for it. Incredible. He was a ladies' man. Really? Yeah. Though not as much of a ladies' man as Rasputin. Rasputin. Mm -hmm. I was watching Key and Peele, and it was at like Ancestry.com, and like all the white people were like, oh, I'm related to them, blah, blah, blah. And Thomas all Jefferson. The black people were like, I'm related to Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Yeah, he was a popular fella. Okay, everybody say bye, Nick. Bye.